Hello, everyone. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah, and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday, and you're not going to want to miss it. We also upload the video version on YouTube on Wednesdays as well, so make sure you are subscribed. Now, you guys, as you can tell by the title of today's episode, today we have a truly tragic case. As I mentioned to you last week, we have dedicated the month of June to talking about fatal friendships, and today's case definitely falls in that category. Today we are talking about the case of Shanda Scherer, who was 12 years old when she was murdered in New Albany, Indiana. This case truly is, like I said, a travesty, it's tragic, it's heartbreaking, and what happened to Shanda should have never ever happened. I'm very curious to hear what you guys have to say about this one. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Shanda Sher was born on June 6th, 1979. So by the time you guys hear this, her birthday would have just passed. She was born to her parents, Stephen and Jacqueline. And Stephen and Jacqueline divorced shortly after Shanda was born. And then Jacqueline and Shanda moved to Louisville, Kentucky, where Jacqueline remarried married. When Shanda was in Louisville, her mom described her as being a big fish in a small pond. She had this larger-than-life personality, everyone knew her, and everyone loved her. She was your typical happy-go-lucky little girl. Now, Jacqueline did end up getting divorced a second time, and it was after her second divorce that Jacqueline decided that she was going to move her and Shanda to New Albany, Indiana. Now, New Albany, Indiana is located at the southern point of Indiana. It's just across from Louisville, Kentucky. Now, the reason that Jacqueline had moved there was because Jacqueline was actually from New Albany. So when she divorced her husband, she wanted to go back there and be around her family. She wanted to be able to be close to them and have Shanda be raised around them as well. That was something that was very important to her. She wanted to have her people around her. Now, when they moved back to New Albany, Shanda was enrolled into Hazelwood Junior High. Hazelwood Junior High School School had students anywhere between 7th grade and ninth grade, and this was your typical junior high school. There were a lot of students, and there were also a lot of cliques. You had your jocks, you had your cheerleaders, you had the popular kids, the ones that were a little bit more shy and reserved. You had it all at Hazelwood Junior High School, and with Shanda going into this type of environment not knowing a single person, this was definitely a little bit difficult for her to try and navigate. She was going from being this big fish in a small pond to now being a small fish in a big, big pond. And this was, again, something that was very difficult for her. She had never had to do this before, and she was only 12 years old at the time. She wanted to be able to make friends. She wanted everything to go smoothly. She wanted everything to be perfect. Her mother, Jacqueline, remembers that the night before the first day of school, Shanda stayed up trying on at least 10 different outfits because she wanted to make sure that she looked good when she went in the next day. Now, as I mentioned, Hazelwood was very clicky. You had a lot of different groups running around. It was your typical junior high school that you would see in a movie. But something that was a little bit different was that Hazelwood had this group of kids that referred to themselves as the hoodlums. Now, the hoodlums, aka the hoods, as they called them, these were the students, mainly the girls, that were considered to be the opposite of the cheerleader girls. They were basically just your edgier students. They were the ones who rebelled. They had a lot of attitude. They would fight. They would smoke cigarettes. They were just your basic teenage rebels. But just like most cliques, everyone typically has a leader of the pack. And for the hoods, that was no different. The leader of the hoodlums at Hazelwood Junior High School was none other than a girl named Melinda Loveless. Melinda Loveless was born on October 28, 1975 to her parents, Marjorie and Larry Loveless. Melinda was 
was the youngest of three daughters, and her dad had served in the military during the Vietnam War. And once he returned, even though he was deemed as this hero, there was definitely a darker side to him. According to Marjorie, his wife, she claimed that when everyone would go to sleep at night, Larry would stay up and dress up in his daughter's clothing or his wife's underwear. He would also put on makeup and walk around the house, not thinking anyone would notice. Along with that, and even more so than that, Larry did become very abusive at certain points. Larry was known to be a serial cheater, and he would tell everyone that him and Marjorie were deeply involved in the swinger lifestyle. However, according to Marjorie, this had nothing to do with her, and it had everything to do with Larry's fantasy. Larry had this fantasy of him and Marjorie being swingers, and even though it went against everything that Marjorie stood for, she had to go along with it, because if she didn't, Larry would lash out at her physically, and he would beat her. It was said that Larry would host these sex parties where he would invite other men over to quote unquote share Marjorie with his friends or his co workers, and everyone would come and join. And this had a really, really terrible impact on Marjorie's mental health, so much so that she attempted to take her own life several times because of this. However, each time when Larry found out about this, instead of trying to get her help or instead of trying to better their marriage, he would beat her into oblivion so badly that she would need to be hospitalized, and one time he was even charged with battery. Now, it was also said that the abuse did not stop with Marjorie because according to Larry's eldest daughter, she claimed that her father molested her for quite some time. Now, ironically enough, Larry did become a marriage counselor at him and Marjorie's church, and he had a terrible reputation while he was doing this. He had a reputation of making women uncomfortable. He would try and come on to some of the women that were going to see him, and in 1990, the two, Larry and Marjorie, finally divorced and Larry moved to Florida before ultimately dying in a car crash in 1998. Now, Melinda, their youngest daughter, she did unfortunately see a lot of this behavior growing up. She saw how Larry treated her mother. She saw what their relationship looked like behind closed doors. However, when Melinda went to school at Hazelwood, you would never expect that to be the case because Melinda was was described by her classmates as the girl that every girl wanted to be and the girl that every guy wanted. You either wanted to be with her or you wanted to be her. And like I said, Melinda was the ringleader of the hoods and she was decently older than the other members of this clique as well. Melinda was 16 years old and in the ninth grade, so she had been held back quite a few times, but this didn't seem like a red flag to the other students. They actually added it to her sort of coolness factor. It gave her more points socially because it was believed that because Melinda was older, she was cooler, she had more life experience, she was more mature. They looked up to her more because of it. Now, Melinda was said to be rough around the edges and she wasn't your cheerleader or typical happy-go-lucky girl. She was definitely edgy. She was definitely rebellious. And personality-wise, Melinda was described as someone who some said, could quote unquote not be bothered. That is how people described her. She looked at everyone like they were beneath her or below her, and she really held on to this role of being the ringleader of the hoods and felt a lot of power because of that. She tried her hardest to come off very intimidating, and she was the type where if you were to cross her or get on her bad side, she would turn not only herself against you, but everyone else that she possibly could as well to leave you with no one. Now, something else to know about Melinda is that she was openly gay while she was at Hazelwood, and she was one of the only lesbians at this school at a time and a place where it wasn't very normally accepted. We're talking about the Midwest in the 1990s. This was definitely more of a taboo subject, but Melinda, she did not care. And while she was at Hazelwood, Melinda was actually dating another girl there, and this girl was named Amanda Hevrin. Melinda was a 16-year-old 
ninth grader, and Amanda was a 15-year-old eighth grader at the time that they started dating. Amanda was known to be a jock at the school. She played basketball. She wore her letterman jacket every day. She was a big deal to the other students, and the two of them, Melinda and Amanda, were the only two openly lesbian people at Hazelwood, so people definitely made a big deal about their relationship, and they ended up being the it couple that everyone talked about. But again, behind the scenes, things looked different. The relationship between Amanda and Melinda was pretty toxic. Melinda still tried to maintain this role of dominance in her relationship with Amanda. It was that same role of dominance that she had as the ringleader of this hoodlums clique at school. She wanted that to translate over to her relationship as well. But Amanda wasn't really having this. She didn't like the idea of being controlled. She didn't like the idea of one person being more dominant in the relationship, especially Melinda being more dominant. She felt like Melinda was very bossy, very controlling, very jealous, and she very much took control over what Amanda could and couldn't do. Amanda felt like she was very needy at times. It just wasn't the best relationship. But again, they were 16 and 15 years old in junior high. Now, on one specific occasion, Melinda was sent to detention one day and Amanda was also sent to detention. So both of them after school have to go to detention and Amanda got to detention before Melinda did. When Melinda walked into the classroom where detention was being held at, she saw that Amanda did not seem to care that she walked in the room. Amanda didn't turn around and immediately give her the attention that she felt that she deserved. And instead, Amanda was talking to another girl. Melinda sat there enraged as she saw Amanda laughing and talking to this girl and again, not giving any attention to Melinda herself. Now, after detention was over, Amanda did take the initiative and introduce Melinda to the girl that she had been sitting next to and talking to. And that girl was Amanda's new friend, Shanda Sharer. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Shanda was a new student at Hazelwood. She was in seventh grade at the time. She was 12 years old and she was just trying to fit in. Everyone who spoke about Shanda said that she was an absolute sweetheart. She just wanted to be your friend. She wanted to be able to have a fun and normal junior high experience. She was incredibly kind and she also had this really distinctive big hair. Shanda loved having big voluminous hair she would curl her hair and she would tease it and it was just this big big voluminous hair that was her defining characteristic and she absolutely loved it when you go back and look at pictures of Shanda you see her with this amazing gorgeous hair and that was something that a lot of people remembered her by Shanda also had an incredible smile, and we say this time and time again here on these true crime cases, but her smile truly did light up a room. She was just a happy girl, and she just wanted friends. And when she met Amanda in detention that day, she felt like this could be her friend. According to Shanda's mom, Jacqueline, she said that Shanda went home after school that day and told Jacqueline about meeting Amanda and how she thought that this could be someone that she could actually be friends with. Shanda also was really big on wanting to turn 13 because again she was only 12 years old but she wanted to fit in with the older crowd at Hazelwood that was something that was really important to her she wanted to be deemed as the cool girl she wanted to be with the cool crowd and she felt like in order to do that she had to be older because again she was only 12 years old Jacqueline said that she absolutely hated telling people that she was 12 years old and could not wait until she could tell people that she was going to be a teenager now, while Shanda was looking at Amanda as this potential new friend, this girl who could take her under her wing, be her new friend, introduce her to new people, Amanda had a very different motive. Amanda was really getting tired of her relationship with Melinda, as I recently told you. She felt like she could never make Melinda happy and didn't really like feeling like Melinda had this control over her. And she was looking at Shanda as a potential new 
girlfriend. Now, as you can probably imagine, Melinda was not having any part of this because now you had this almost love triangle that Shanda really didn't even know that she was a part of in the very beginning. You had Melinda who was dating Amanda, but Amanda liked Shanda. There was a lot going on. There was a lot going on and Melinda did not like any of it. She wanted Amanda all to herself. She despised the fact that not only did she feel like she was losing control over Amanda, but she also felt a certain level of disrespect that she was losing Amanda to a seventh grader who was 12 years old. That part in particular drove her absolutely crazy. The fact that a 16 year old could be losing her girlfriend to a 12 year old. I do think that we should preface the fact that a 12 year old is really involved in this scenario at all in terms of romantic relationships is kind of wild, but again, I digress. Now, I want to move on to September 13th, 1991, because this is when Amanda wrote a letter to Shanda. And in the letter, Amanda asks Shanda if she would like to progress their relationship past a friendship and more into a romantic relationship. In the letter, Amanda says, quote, I have a question for you. Do you kind of, in a way, like girls? Do you think I'm cute or something? End quote. Now, this was the beginning of a letter exchange going back and forth between Shanda and Amanda. And over time, Shanda started to like Amanda as well, which made their friendship in turn turn into more of a romantic relationship, or at least as much as one can be at that age. Now, while this was all happening, Amanda and Melinda were still together. They were still dating, technically, but one day, Melinda got a hold of one of the letters that Amanda had wrote to Shanda, and this is when things really began to unravel. When Melinda saw this letter that her girlfriend was writing to Shanda, she absolutely lost it. She confronted Amanda in the middle of the hallway, and students say that she was screaming her head off. She was yelling at Amanda, she was pushing her, and she threw Amanda's letterman jacket jacket straight at her face. And this fight really seemed to be the end of Melinda and Amanda. It seemed this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Now they have this big blowout fight, but the relationship is now over. Now the next period of when the students had to go to classes right after this fight, students in the same class as Melinda say that right after this fight occurred, Melinda was absolutely enraged and she kept repeating how much she wanted to beat Shanda up. Now, according to the students that were in the class, a lot of them tried to talk Melinda down from this. They told her that there was really no reason for Melinda, who again was 16 years old at this time, to give any attention to a 12-year-old girl all over a junior high relationship. It all seemed very juvenile and very immature. That was the pattern here. It all just seemed a little bit too much, and her friends did try and talk her down from it, and Melinda did seem to kind of understand what her friends were saying saying, at least to the outside. Her friends look back and believe that this was really her just trying to appease them in the moment to get them off of her back. But at the time, she did seem to kind of come to grips with what her friends were saying about how this was not something to be so worked up about. Now, the following month, in October of 1991, Hazelwood was having what they called their harvest dance. It was almost like a homecoming type of dance, and Amanda had asked Shanda to go to this dance with her, and Shanda accepted and agreed to go. Now, Melinda wasn't planning on going to the dance itself. However, she lived right next door to the school. It was said that from standing at the school, you could see Shanda's house. That was how close it was. It was just yards away if that. Now, while Melinda was sitting at home at the night of the dance, she ended up getting word that Amanda had brought Shanda to this dance, and this was not going to fly for Melinda. Melinda immediately got dressed, walked out of her door, walked over to the school, walked into the gym where the dance was being held, and beelined straight for Shanda. She walked up behind her, grabbed her by the back of the head, and threw her down to the ground and began beating 
lighting her up in front of everyone. Now, according to the other students that were at the dance, Amanda sat back and did not do a single thing. She stood back watching as two girls were technically fighting over her, and many classmates believe that Amanda was actually enjoying this moment. She enjoyed feeling wanted by two girls, so much so that they would physically fight over one another. However, finally, Melinda did get off of Shanda, and Shanda was absolutely destroyed. She was distraught. She was crying. She was incredibly upset, understandably so, and she quickly left the dance. Now, according to Shanda's mom, she claimed that ever since that fight of the dance, there was a definite shift in Shanda's personality. When she came home that day, she was not the same. Before the fight, Shanda typically loved talking to her mom. Every day after school, she would come home. They would chit-chat about what went on. They were very open with each other. However, after this dance and after this fight, things were not the same. Every time Shanda would come home from school, she would go straight into her room. She did not want to talk to anyone. She didn't want to talk to her mom. She also stopped caring about what she was wearing. Again, Shanda, like I said in the beginning, she loved looking good. She loved having good clothes. She loved fashion. She loved outfits. However, that all went out the window and she started just wearing dark, baggy clothes. She did not care what she was wearing. And at this point, Jacqueline, her mom, decided that she needed to figure out what was going on with her daughter because clearly there was something going on. And Shanda did not tell her mom about the fight at this point. So Jacqueline did not know. So because of this, one day while Shanda was at school, Jacqueline went into Shanda's room and started digging around to see if she could figure out what was going on with her daughter. Now, while she did so, she was able to stumble across some letters that Amanda had sent to Shanda. Now, these letters were letters from after the dance. And when reading these letters, Shanda learned about the fight because Amanda was apologizing. She also learned that Amanda was trying to get Shanda back. And she also learned that Amanda and Shanda had engaged in some sort of sexual contact with one another. Now, when Jacqueline read all of this, she knew that she needed to step in because clearly Shanda was struggling. She was not happy. There was a lot going on. And along with that, she also felt like Shanda was too young to be dealing with all of these different obstacles that were being thrown her way. She felt like she wanted her daughter to just worry about being a kid. She was 12 years old. She shouldn't have to worry about dating or fighting in romantic relationships or having toxic romantic relationships or friendships. She just wanted Shanda to focus on being a happy kid at that moment. So because of this, Jacqueline made the decision to pull Shanda from Hazelwood and enroll her into a different school. So Shanda then was enrolled into a Catholic school called My Lady of Perpetual Health. When Shanda got to her new school, it was a much easier transition this time. She made friends very quickly. She seemed a lot happier. Her grades were doing so much better. It seemed like the perfect decision for Shanda. Now, meanwhile, at Hazelwood, Melinda's bad girl reputation was starting to fall flat because people really began to turn on her after they heard about the stunt that she pulled at the Harvest Dance, her starting this fight with Shanda. People thought it was really petty and really low of her at 16 years old to be physically beating up a 12-year-old girl. So now because of this, Melinda needed to start searching for new friends because the ones that she had were no longer there for her. So she started spending a lot of time at a local skateboarding park in Louisville Kentucky. Now, like I said, Louisville and New Albany were not far from each other, so she would be able to pop over there and spend time there and spend time with the other kids that were at the skate park. And it was while she was there that Melinda met a couple new friends. One of these friends was named 17-year-old Lori Tackett. Now, Lori was from Madison, Indiana and was a student at Madison High School. However, she dropped 
out. Lori grew up in a very religious family and she rebelled against everything her parents taught her by the time she was in high school and she really grew to obsess over the opposite things that she was taught all of her life. She had an obsession with death, with witchcraft, with cults. She was really into the darker side of things. Now while Melinda was spending time at the skate park, her and Lori became very, very close and they confided in one another about all of the things that were going Going on in their lives, and Melinda specifically confided in Lori about what had been going on between her, Amanda, and Shanda. She also explained to Lori that now that Shanda had changed schools, Melinda was really looking into getting back together with Amanda. She wanted to get back into Amanda's good graces, and she felt like with Shanda out of the way, this was now the perfect opportunity to do so. Now, when it came to Lori's response about all of this, Lori was the type of friend that when she was hearing what Melinda was saying, she would be amping Melinda up. She would be saying things to get Melinda more angry and more worked up about the situation. She wanted Melinda to really still feel that same rage that she did while Shanda was still at the school. Melinda also told things to Lori about how she felt like Amanda was still playing games with her. Even though she wanted to restart their relationship and get back together, she felt like Amanda was toying her along a little bit. She would still bring up Shanda. She would still talk about wanting to go see Shanda. And so because of that, it only enraged Melinda more because even though Shanda was not there physically, it was clear to her that Amanda still had some sort of emotional connection to Shanda. So with this all being said, we are going to fast forward a little bit. We are going to move on to the morning of January 11th, 1992. On this particular morning, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office received a call regarding a possible homicide about 12 miles away in Madison, Indiana. Now, when police got to the scene, they were met with two hunters who had made this call. When they spoke with these hunters, the hunters told them that they were out hunting that morning when they came across what they believed to be a body. These hunters then brought police over to where the body was, and when police got a closer look, they saw what they believed to be the body of a young female. Now, immediately, police saw that this body was very, very badly burned. They also saw that the body was wrapped in a red blanket, and they also saw that there was a big plastic bottle, one of those 32-ounce plastic soda bottles that you would see. There was one of those. It was empty, laying on the ground near the body, and when police smelled what was inside of the bottle, it was clear that there was gasoline or had been gasoline gasoline inside of it at one point. Now, police stayed there the rest of the day. They called in the crime scene unit. Everyone was coming in to canvas the scene. And this was an all-day operation. Police stayed there for hours and hours. And at hour 11 of being at this crime scene, police received a phone call from the Jefferson County Station saying that there was a girl who had stopped in at the station with her parents claiming to know information about the murder. Now, at this point, police had nothing to go off of. They did not know who their victim was. The body was so badly burned that there was no defining characteristics really. They really were starting at square one. So when they heard that someone was coming in with information about this murder, they immediately knew that they had to act fast. The police went back down to the station to speak with the girl and the girl at the station was 15 year old Tony Lawrence. Now Tony Lawrence was also a student at Madison High School and when police saw her, Tony was hysterically crying. She was almost inconsolable. When police were finally able to sit down with her and get her to start talking, Tony said that she knew what had happened to the girl who had been burned. Tony said that on the night of January 10th, 1992, her best friend, another girl named Hope Rippey, who was also a student at Madison High School, had invited her to a concert in Louisville. And according to Tony, she said that Hope had also invited some other friends. She kind of set it up that this was going to be a group of them together. Now, just for a little bit of context, Madison is about an hour away from Louisville. Now, Tony agreed 
agrees to go. She's excited to go to this concert. And later that night, her and Hope get picked up by Hope's friend, Lori Tackett, the same girl that Melinda had been hanging out with at the skate park. Now, the two of them knew Lori through Madison High School because Lori used to be a student there. However, again, she had dropped out. Now, according to Tony, she said that when her and Hope got into the car with Lori, Lori turned around and said to them, we're going to kill a little girl tonight. Now, when Tony heard this, she claimed that she did not believe it. She thought that this was all just an over-exaggeration. She thought maybe they were going to be fighting some girl. Maybe they thought that they were going to be pranking someone or scaring a girl. She never believed that they were actually going to be killing someone. But again, similarly to the pattern that we have seen in this case, Tony said that she just wanted to be accepted by her friends. So she went along with whatever Lori said. If Lori said that they were going to go kill a girl, she just went along with it because she wanted to be accepted. She really didn't ask questions. Now, at this point, the three girls, Lori, Hope, and Tony, drove for another hour to the skate park in Louisville, the one that Melinda frequently went to. Now, the three girls then met Melinda at the skate park. So now it's the four of them. Them together. Melinda, Hope, Lori, and Tony. Tony said that when Melinda showed up, it was very clear that she was very, very angry and she was also holding a butcher knife. Tony said that the atmosphere changed very quickly when Melinda got to the skate park and it was very clear that Melinda was very serious about whatever it was that they were about to do. Tony said that Melinda then started explaining to the three girls that they were all going to kill Shanda Scherer in order to get back at her ex-girl friend Amanda. Melinda then explained the whole story start to finish and explained how Shanda was a backstabber who tried to steal her girlfriend and she needed to pay back for what she did. Now, at this point, Melinda told Lori to drive them all to Shanda's house in New Albany. So on this particular night of January 10th, Shanda was staying at her dad. So the four of them, Melinda, Hope, Lori and Tony, they all drive to Shanda's dad's house. Now, at this point, Melinda ordered Tony and Hope to go up to the door and try and get Shanda to get into the car. Melinda told the girls that in order to do this, because obviously Shanda had never seen Tony and Hope before, it was very unlikely that she was going to be so willing to just walk out of the door with them. Melinda told them to tell her that they are friends of Amanda's, that Amanda needs to talk to her, and that Shanda needs to get in the car with them because Amanda is meeting them at a hangout spot called the Witch's Castle. Now, the Witch's Castle was a very well-known area to the teenagers in New Albany. It was an old rundown structure in the back part of the woods. It was honestly a little creepy. It was known to be a little bit spooky, a little bit scary that some of the kids would be brave enough to go out to. They would kind of use it as their hangout spot. They would smoke weed out there. They would just be teenagers out there. But regardless, that is what Melinda told Tony and Hope to say. So Tony and Hope get out of the car. They go up and they knock on the front door. Now Shanda does come to the door and Tony and Hope say what they they were told to say. Now, Shanda responds to this by telling them that she's not able to leave the house at that moment because she needs to wait for her dad and stepmom to go to sleep. But if they came back a couple hours later around midnight, she would be able to go with them. So after that, Hope and Tony agreed. They said that they would be back and they went back to the car where Melinda and Lori were. Now, when Melinda heard about this, this was not a part of her plan. It definitely made Melinda a little bit angry because she felt like she didn't have total total control of what was going on. It wasn't all playing out to a T like she had hoped, but nevertheless, she decided that they were going to wait a couple hours and then return back to Shanda's house. So a few hours later, around midnight, the girls all return back to Shanda's dad's house, and this time, Lori and Hope go to the door. So Tony and Melinda are staying back in the car. Lori and Hope go to the door. They knock on the door, and Shanda comes to the door again. Now, this time, Lori and Hope told Shanda that Amanda was waiting in the car for her in the driveway, and that's how they were able to lure Shanda out. Now, Shanda did leave all of her belongings at the house, including her purse, and to this day, Shanda's mom says that she believes Shanda more than likely thought and was just under the impression that she was going to have a conversation with Amanda 
in the driveway because something about Shanda, she never left her purse anywhere. It always came with her. She always took it everywhere. But for her to leave the purse at home, that made her mom think that she just figured that they were going to have an innocent conversation in the driveway. But either way, Shanda agrees to get in the car. So she walks out with Hope and with Lori and gets into the front passenger seat of the car. Now, very quickly, Shanda realizes that Amanda is not there, but who was there was Melinda. Melinda was hiding in the back seat under a blanket, and as soon as Shanda got into the car, she immediately jumped out from underneath the blanket and held a knife to Shanda's throat. Melinda then told Lori, who was driving the car, to start driving towards Witch's Castle, all while keeping the knife to Shanda's throat. On the way to Witch's Castle, Melinda continuously asked Shanda about her relationship with Amanda, asking her all of the things that the two of them had done together, physically, sexually, really just trying to intimidate Shanda and scare her her to death. Now, initially, when they got to Witch's Castle, Hope and Tony claimed that they were very freaked out by what was going on. They did not expect the night to turn this way, and they stayed in the car while Lori, Melinda, and Shanda got out. Now, once they walked over to the Witch's Castle area, Lori and Melinda ordered Shanda to take all of her clothes off and then set them on fire. Once Lori set the clothes on fire, she looked at Shanda and said, that's going to be you before the night is over. Lori and Melinda then began beating Shanda relentlessly. Melinda had tried to slash Shanda's throat, but the knife was too dull. Now, at this point, Hope decides that she's not as freaked out anymore. She gets out of the car and helps Lori and Melinda by holding Shanda down while they each took turns stabbing Shanda in the chest. Hope returned back to the car after this, and Lori and Melinda strangled Shanda with a rope until she was unconscious before putting her in the trunk of the car. Now, it is believed that when they put Shanda in the trunk of the car, Lori and Melinda thought that Shanda was dead. And part of this belief was because once Lori and Melinda got into the car, they told the other two girls Shanda had died. Now, on the way back to Madison, once they start driving from Witch's Castle back to Madison, Indiana, the girls began hearing noise noises in the trunk of the car, and that is when they realize Shanda was not dead and that she was very much still alive. Now, at this point, the girls stop off at a gas station where they bought a two liter soda from a plastic bottle. Once they got the soda, they took it outside, poured all of the soda out, and then filled the bottle with gasoline. They then began driving around backcountry roads, making several stops to open the trunk and continue to beat Shanda. It was said that on one occasion when they stopped the car, Lori got out and opened the trunk, helped Shanda sit up, and saw her eyes roll to the back of her head. Her entire face and body were covered in blood, and she was unable to speak. That is how badly she had been beaten at this point. Lori then beat Shanda again with a tire iron over her head, and Melinda used that same tool to sexually assault Shanda. The girls also so sprayed Windex over Shanda in her open wounds while mocking and laughing at her. After driving around for hours, stopping here and there to continue Shanda's torture, the girls finally stopped at Lemon Road, where Shanda's body would ultimately be discovered. Now, at this point, Tony said that she remained in the car while the other three girls got out of the car with Shanda. They carried Shanda to a nearby field, and Hope was the one who poured gasoline all over Shanda's body, and Melinda was the one who set her on fire. Based off of the autopsy, autopsy report, it is revealed that Shanda was still alive when her whole body was bursted into flames. All in all, Shanda suffered 10 hours of torture before she ultimately was killed. After Shanda's body was set on fire, those four girls then went to McDonald's that morning at approximately 9.30 a.m. for breakfast. Tony claimed that while they were there, Melinda was sure that they were going to be able to get away with it because she had read somewhere that when you set someone's body on fire, they become unidentifiable. After breakfast, Tony and Hope were then dropped off at home before Melinda and Lori went back to Lori's house. Melinda called Amanda, actually, while they were at Lori's house and made plans to see 
her later that day. Then, a few hours later, Lori, Melinda, and another friend of theirs named Crystal all went over to Amanda's home. Now, Crystal at this point had been made aware of what had happened. Lori and Melinda had bragged to Crystal about what they did the night before. Now, when they got to Amanda's home, Melinda told Amanda what she had done to Shanda. Now, at first, Amanda did not believe it. She thought that Melinda was bluffing. She was bragging. She could not believe that Melinda was capable of something like this. That was until Melinda proved it to Amanda by showing Amanda the trunk of Lori's car where Shanda had been kept. There was blood all in the car. There were handprints in the car from when Shanda was trying to escape. And that is when Amanda finally believed what Melinda had been saying. Amanda was so taken aback that she immediately told Melinda, Lori, and Crystal that they needed to go and promised Melinda that she would not tell anyone. So that is the story that Tony had told police front to back, start to finish with all of those details. But police still needed DNA and physical proof to be able to link Shanda to the burnt body. And it was through dental records that police were able to positively identify the body discovered as Shanda Scherer. Now, with all of this information, police knew what they needed to do. So they went ahead and arrested Melinda, Hope, Lori, and Tony. All four of them were arrested for the murder of Shanda Scherer, and they were all being charged as adults. Now, because Tony was the one who came forward to police and was willing to testify against the other girls, she accepted a plea deal and her charges were dropped to only criminal confinement. Hope, Lori, and Melinda all took a plea deal as well to avoid the death penalty and pled guilty to first-degree murder and criminal confinement. Now, this is where I know your guys' heads are going to spin, because as far as the sentencing went, Hope was sentenced to 50 years, Tony was sentenced to 20 years, Lori was sentenced to 60 years, and Melinda was also sentenced to 60 years. But as you're listening to me here today, all four of these girls they're all released from prison. Tony Lawrence was released in December of the year 2000 after serving only nine years and remained on parole until December of 2002. Hope Rippey was released on April 28, 2006 after serving 14 years of her 50-year sentence and remained on parole until 2011. Lori Tackett was released on January 11, 2018, which, mind you, is the 26th year anniversary of Shanda's death. And Lori was released after only serving 26 years. And Melinda Loveless, she was released on September 5th, 2019, after serving a little over 26 years of her sentence as well, and is currently on parole in Kentucky. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I read this, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that all four of these women have been released. It absolutely blew my mind. I know I try and keep an unbiased opinion here when explaining to you guys these cases and not give in my two cents at all, but that was something that I I just could not believe. I could not believe that all four of these women have been released from prison to this day. I'm just going to believe it. Now, there was a Dr. Phil episode on Shanda's case where Jacqueline, Shanda's mother, as well as Shanda's sister, Paige, they spoke with Hope Rippey. Now, during the interview, Hope was filled with tears. She explains how she thinks about Shanda's murder every single day and also said that she never thought when going out that night what was going to happen would have happened. They were never planning on murdering Shanda. However, as we know from Tony's confession, that's not ultimately the case if Tony was telling the truth because in Tony's confession, she claimed the opposite. Tony claimed that once they got into the car, Lori told them that they were planning on murdering Shanda that night. Now, Lori, Lori Tackett, she was also interviewed and her interview was done while she was completing her prison sentence and she claimed that she succumbed to peer pressure and that she never actually wanted to kill Shanda. She claimed that things just spiraled out of control way too fast. Now, while in prison, Melinda enrolled in a program known as the Indiana Canine Assistance Network, where she trained dogs to ultimately help other people with disabilities. So she would train emotional support dogs or train dogs to help people with different medical disabilities. And the program claimed that Melinda was one of their best trainers. 
Now, while Melinda was in this program, Jacqueline, Shanda's mother, she ended up hearing about this. And so she ended up donating a dog to the program named Angel in honor of Shanda. Now, Shanda's mom did receive a lot of backlash in regards to this. Many people couldn't imagine or fathom why Shanda's mom would want to try and do something for the greater good. However, Jacqueline hit back at all of those people and said, quote, it's my choice to make. Shanda is my child. And if you don't let good things come from bad things, nothing gets better. And I know what my child would want. My child would want this, end quote. And that, you guys, is the case of Shanda Scherer. I am very interested to hear what you guys have to say about this one, so please let me know in the comments below. But with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah, and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you haven't. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday. You guys are not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.